our talk show today is Big Data, What Does the City Know About Me? And we have as our guest Richard Sennett, sociologist at the London School of Economics and New York University. Richard, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm curious to hear, I asked Saskia the, the same thing. Uh, you live in both London and New York. What do you think that London and New York know about you? Well, I think that London knows about me much more personally than New York because it has many, many more um, um, uh, CCTV cameras. Uh, it's got a huge number. And uh, they're uh, posted uh, not only in public places, but in semi-private ones as well. So that if you um, uh, go in the backyard of uh, certain parts of London, uh, of a house, uh, your neighbor's CCTV camera will pick you up, you know. So it's a more intrusive society in London than New York. And there, it's, um, it's rather frightening. And the Brits seem to, I mean, they're disturbed by it, but they, they've they just, it's naturalized. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a different thing. I mean, I, I think about I, the issue about big data is that it's really, as this example makes clear, it's how the technology is used, not the technology in itself, you know. It, in that respect, I uh, wanted to uh, present you with a quote that we quoted on the blog of uh, Stadsleben, in which you said, no one likes a city that's too smart. Right. So we like smart cities, but we don't like smart-ass cities. Yeah, well, I meant something very particular by that. I think an abuse of this technology is uh, lies in... Um, in using it to replace people's kind of in, uh, inductive reasoning about their circumstances. Um, a, a smart city like Songdu in South Korea is a place that really uh, tells people where to go uh, a, a minute by minute. Literally it's, tells them. Literally yeah. tells them. How to there conduct are themselves if in you space. Get on your, if you're walking and you get on your smartphone, it will tell you exactly where you should go and shouldn't go. Uh, now, that's an extreme, but I think a lot of the problem with smart cities is that you write an algorithm for people's behavior and it deprives them of inductively reasoning about the environment that they find themselves in. And um, I worry about this, about this stupefying effect of technology and that it's used as a kind of replacement for people's social intelligence about where they are, how to move around, who's around them, and so on. Um, many of these smart apps are extremely paranoid. They'll take you to a place with the least people if you're walking. You know, because the idea is that other people are threatening. And so, is, this, is this the fault of technology, Richard, or is this the fault of us as users that we let ourselves be ordered around so easily? Well, it's, it's the fault. Uh, I mean, the market puts out there what people want to use. So, uh, you know, we're buying this technology. Um, I don't think that the machinery should be demonized, but I think we have a very, very primitive, so far, understanding of what it can do, can't do, and shouldn't do, you know? Are there ways that we can use big data to create smart cities that don't stupefy us, but that make us more aware, more connected to our neighbors, uh, more social? The data which is, the kind of big data which is more useful is more impersonal, that is like counting cars. But the big data that, for instance, recognizes your face and keeps it on file in the cloud permanently as you're walking the street is abusive. And we're just on the verge of that, that face recognition technology. 
we're going to really use it um, to get everybody to know where everybody is all the time because of this uh, ability to to do face recognition that would be that's really big brother yeah now we can choose to do that or not um, but that's there you touched I think on what is really the essence of the issue we can choose to do that and I think we as citizens may have a very different interest in this than we as government or we as business right well the business one is uh, that's a that's a problem and it's something to, to fight I mean the selling of as you point out of personal data to other people and so on it should be a crime it's not a crime now uh, uh, if it were made a crime uh, that private data were couldn't be uh, it would be a crime to sell private data we'd see a lot of these businesses like Google <laughs> shrink uh, that's one of the ways they make money. Uh, I, I think the whole Snowden thing was was really great. I th it, he, to me, is a hero because he raises the issue of how much big data should a government legitimately collect on its citizens. And it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's mm -hmm. a question of what kind of data. What are we willing not to know about other people? I'm willing not to know about Angela Merkel's uh, cell phone use. No. Uh, and that it's a political decision. The, in the States, um, the security agencies, without anybody's permission, have been monitoring, as you know, of uh, phone call use. Mm -hmm. uh, should that happen? That should be illegal. So, I mean, it's a question of, of um, I really think it's a question of, of what we decide we want to do with this, with, with big data. And uh, as you know, one of the things about big data is that the, the bigness of it, the very hugeness of it, means that this data is actually unanalyzable. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, it would be like counting drops of water in the sea until somebody devises a search uh, mechanism, a search engine for a specific kind of thing. It's at that, that moment that the politics of big data, I think, uh, kick in. It's not about restricting the amount of, say, data on traffic flows, you know. But it's a matter of saying, okay, you cannot, if you're a government, um, this is the data you can't collect. You cannot collect uh, my phone calls. No. And if we look at using technology to, to make cities smart and therefore more livable, you say there's a danger of top-down technology making the city stupefying. But is it also possible to use technology to create informal energy to uh, allow for serendipity and the mess which is so, so typical of the urban condition? Well, sure. Uh, but you'd have to think, what's the technology you're using? I mean, uh, Twitter, which was never designed for political protest, is, is a great tool in mobilizing. Now, what it does is gets them physically someplace where they're together, whether they can riot or protest the government or whatever. It's not political in itself, but it's an enabling technology. That's all to the good. I, I think, you know, what makes cities stupid is the use of this technology to prevent people from having face-to-face -face experience with each other. And what makes it smart is, as in the case of those Twitter crowds, uh, enabling them to get face-to-face. -face. So technology that, that brings people together rather than just spreading facts about us. Right. Yeah. That seems to be good, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You wrote in, uh, in, uh, in one of your articles about the 
city of uh, Masdar, I think uh, supposed to be the first carbon neutral city in the, in the Middle East. And you said that it's also supposed to be a smart city. And you protested against the, uh, what did you call it? You can, it's a place where you can only choose menu options rather than actually creating the menu. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's a very predetermined city. You, you make choices among options that an engineer has essentially uh, created for you. Uh, and it's very undemocratic. Um, one of the effects of big data is that it makes a very tight, it uses statistics to make a very tight fit between form and function. Mustar has got a very fixed form. Uh, it does one thing very, very well, for instance, the driverless cars. It's fitted up for that. But the problem is that if people want to behave differently, or even the parts of the technology change, the whole system breaks down. Uh -huh. So you have, uh, it's, a, it's a, a sort of basic, uh, very tight fit between form and function. You have a lot of technological obsolescence. So the technology gets obsolete while the city continues on. The city grows, the technology is fitted for something else and can adapt. I'll give you a, an example in New York of that, which is a very tight fit between form and function in creating office towers in Wall Street. Well, now the financial district is shrinking, largely thanks to the back offices are leaving the city and so on. And so, uh, People want to convert these office towers into uh, residential towers instead. But the, they're over-engineered in the sense that the form function is so tight that it's very difficult to convert this old urban form into something new. Everything was de originally designed for it to be this perfectly purring machine, very unflexible and uh, very, very efficient in that sense. Minimum use of, 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 of energy and so on. Well, that's got its downside. The city grows and the buildings don't. Yeah, that's the, that's the evolution that makes us all so fascinated by cities as organisms. And if I understand just to, to end our conversation with a reflection on the theme of the talk show this month, uh, the theme being big data, what does the city know about me? If I talk to you, then perhaps we should have chosen as the theme uh, big data, what do I know about my city? Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Thank you very much. We'll do that on the next edition. Thank you very much, Richard Seda. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.